Hello, and welcome back to the Voicemails from History podcast. This is your host, Mr. Amin. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the European World War II refugees in Asia and Africa. Migration, forced or voluntary, is a phenomenon as old as time. Humans have constantly and consistently moved around, leaving old homes to make new ones. Migration is also currently a hot-button topic. The issues to do with refugees, immigration, asylum-seeking and integration, as well as Europe's so-called refugee crisis, have all deeply affected our understanding of migration. The end of World War II brought about one of the largest population movements in modern world history. According to Malcolm Proudfoot's research, and in a more recent publication by Peter Gatrill, approximately 40 to 60 million Europeans from all backgrounds became displaced and were seeking asylum in one way or another. In his book, The Making of the Modern Refugee, Peter Gatrill poses an interesting question. Has the prominent feature of involuntary migration in the modern era been episodic or systematic? There's a widespread tendency to view the refugee crisis as being temporary or an aberration in the grand scheme of things, rather than, as he puts it, a recurring phenomenon. For me, the question is answerable when we understand the endemic nature of how the military-industrial complex works, something American President Eisenhower had warned against in his farewell address in 1961. The military-industrial complex is a term given to describe the relationship a country has between its military, its defence budget and its public or foreign policy. It works out for the corporations and industries which produce the weapons, who sell and make their money. The governments, in turn, either trade and use the weapons during negotiations, or they put them to direct use, and so war is perpetuated. The chaos creates instability, which in turn produces displaced peoples or refugees, and the pattern continues in a vicious cycle. And because migration is to do with people, and it's so personal, it invokes all layers of emotion. There are those who guide their migration or refugee policy through compassion or sympathy, but then they're accused of having no, quote, clear or regulated policy. Then there's those who view it through the prism of money or culture. So it's fine for you to settle here, but how are you going to contribute economically or acclimatise to our way of living? And then there's hostility, ignorance and hatred. So you weren't born here, or you don't have the right skin colour or religion, or you have a country, so why don't you stay in it and fix it? Wherever you find yourself on the spectrum, our policy towards refugees is guided by emotion and how we understand our place in the world. And a history of migration forces us to consider how do refugees understand their place and how do they deal with the ramifications that that they face. And this brings me to a point I'd like to emphasise before I talk about the actual book itself. There's a tendency to use material like this as a way to score political points of, oh, you know, check this out, Europeans were once also war-torn and engulfed in chaos and violence, and they sought refuge in countries which we now perceive to be chaotic or economically disadvantaged. This approach, in my view, turns the study of history into a political sword, which people can just wield at random to fit their agenda, and that's dangerous territory. When historians come up with questions and they seek answers through sources to provide evidence for their argument, if the content of the evidence challenges their initial thinking, then they need to alter it. And I want this to be on record on my podcast because I feel like it's a very easy trap to fall into. When we seek answers from the past, we colour or taint our research and conclusions with our current opinions or emotions. And that doesn't mean, though, that you can't use historical research in day-to-day life. So if you're a politician or if you're a journalist or just a regular person having a debate about migration with somebody else, then by all means use the material. But as a historian, I think it's important to have a standard bar or process in which you don't force your already made conclusion onto the past before you begin your research. But then again, to play devil's advocate against myself here, if you want to get political, this section of history does offer a unique challenge to Europe and especially to the current Polish government and the country's response to the Syrian refugees seeking asylum in the present. As we'll discuss, less than 80 years ago, in many respects, it was the other way around.
I think that World War II is simultaneously both studied too much and too little. So what I mean is that traditionally the focus of it has always been about how Europe was affected and the long-term consequences for the West. So for example, the story that I got told when I was in school went something like Archduke Franz Ferdinand got shot, Hitler, World War II, Churchill saved us all, the atomic bombs, Cold War, capitalism triumphed, MLK was good, Malcolm X not so good, the Berlin Wall falls as David Hasselhoff sings about freedom, and then the war on terror. Now no one is disputing that these things weren't significant events, but in recent years historians and history departments in schools have reviewed the narrative to discover new ways of teaching the consequences of the Second World War in a more expansive way. So for example, studying the way World War II brought about a social impact on Britain when the general election granted the first win for the Labour Party, despite how loved and respected Churchill was, or studying decolonisation of the empires, the redrawing of the borders in the former colonies, the effect of the Cold War on Latin America and the Middle East. So if you're a history educator looking to revitalise a unit you might have on Poland, or World War II, or modern refugee history, then this book provides a great wealth of primary sources which you can use in your lesson plans. Okay, so I'm going to read out the voicemail for today's episode, and then get into it. The following is an extract from Janina Zabrowski's memoir, One of the Polish Refugees. Quote, A knock on the door in the middle of the night is never a good omen, but in Poland in 1941, it struck fear into everyone. Two years earlier, Poland had been divided by our two constant enemies, Russia and Germany. Our section had fallen under Russian occupation. There was always talk in school about families disappearing suddenly. In that instant, I realised that life as I knew it was over. We would leave all that we had, and everyone we knew and loved, to be taken to Siberia to live out our lives in want, sickness and death. End quote. From 1939 to 1945, hundreds of thousands of civilians from Central, Eastern Europe and the Balkans left Europe to escape Nazi and Soviet occupation and the general strife of war. These included Germans, Greeks, Poles, Baltic peoples, Jews, Russians, Ukrainians and Yugoslavs. Where did some of these refugees go? In 1942, the British established MERRA, the Middle East Relief and Refugee Administration, and it placed around 40,000 Europeans in camps across Syria, Aleppo, Egypt in Cairo, and various cities across Palestine, notably Nusayrat, which by 1944 housed over 12,000 refugees. In 1942, January 11th, an Arabic newspaper named Huna al-Quds published a front-page photograph of Syrian women distributing food and clothes to Greek children who had escaped Nazi occupation. By December 1942, there were 25,000 Polish refugees in Iran, in Tehran, Isfahan and Ahvaz. India, though at the time not independent yet from British rule, was one of the first countries to accept the Polish refugees. By March 1942, over 15,000 Polish children were sent to India. And of the 37,000 Poles who managed to leave the Soviet Union with the Polish army, half found refuge in Africa, mostly in areas of former British Africa, countries like Uganda, Kenya and Zimbabwe. They mostly arrived on British ships to Mombasa in Kenya and Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. This book focuses on the Polish deportees, so I'll give you an overview of why and where the Poles were exiled to, and then discuss the memoirs or diary entries of how they fled the Soviet Union and their experiences across the refugee camps in Asia and Africa. As discussed in episode 1, Poland had been divided between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in 1939, following the non-aggression pact signed by these two powers. Then, in 1941, Hitler broke the pact and launched Operation Barbarossa, invading eastwards, taking over Poland, Ukraine and reaching the gates of Moscow, Stalingrad and Leningrad. Even before 1939, the Soviets had embarked upon a general deportation policy of its ethnic minorities, as we discussed in episode 2, where we focused on the Crimean Tatars. More broadly, they also targeted Ukrainians, Chechens, Baltics, and for our focus today, the Poles. The general estimate from many sources puts the total number of exiled Poles at 1.7 million, 
They were mostly sent to Siberia or the general area between the Arctic Circle and the Mongolian border. They were sent to labour camps as part of the Gulag system. Gulag is an acronym in Russian which I can't say, let alone pronounce, but it roughly translates into the Central Administration of Correctional Camps. It was set up under Lenin and then reached its peak under Stalin's rule, swelling in numbers during the repressions and the terror of the mid to late 30s and then again in the 50s before Stalin died. For the Poles, the report by the NKVD, which was the Soviet Civil Police and Intelligence Commission, stated the following about why the Poles needed deportation. Quote, they exhibit anti-Soviet elements, their social and political backgrounds, their national chauvinism, their religious convictions and their opposition to the socialist order. End quote. The exiled families came from all levels of class, high-ranking officials, teachers, merchants, landowners and farmers. In Russian politics, the Pole had long been depicted as a subversive threat, linked to the Roman Catholic Church and their alleged exploitation of the Ukrainians. And when you read these memoirs, there's a very heavy reference to this tenuous Polish-Russian history. And so the Poles were invicted en masse to the desolate corners of the Soviet Union. They faced starvation, sub-zero temperatures, forced labour, isolation and the trauma of family separation and death. Following Poland's defeat, the Polish government was in exile, based in Paris first, and then, when the Nazis invaded France, it moved its headquarters to London. The in-exile government was coordinating with Britain to pressurise its ally, the Soviet Union, to grant a release of the Polish deportees. A leading Polish politician and army general, Albert Anders, who had been detained by the Soviets, was released after the Nazis broke their non-aggression pact with the USSR. The turning point came with the signing of the sikorsky maisky Agreement in July 1941. The agreement provided for the release of all Poles and the formation of a Polish army on Soviet soil. The document was signed with Winston Churchill and Anthony Eden present. The editor of the book mentions that they used the unfortunate term of amnesty to describe their release. The editor argues that it should have been called emancipation or manumission because the Poles had not been guilty. And so the Poles, upon hearing this decree, began to make their way out of the Soviet Union to join with Anders' army and get out. They mostly followed the route through the Persian Corridor, which passed through Soviet Azerbaijan, to get to Iran, Iraq and into the Middle East. It must be noted as well that the routes of fleeing were quite perilous, so while the Polish refugees were technically told they were free to escape, they didn't receive any help to leave the Soviet Union and the travel out was dangerous. Many died. It was common for mothers and fathers to put their children onto the ships and stay behind. One memoirist had to leave with her sibling, but leave their mother and father behind as they were too ill to travel. Another child boarded her train whilst her mother went to buy some food, only for the train to depart and leave the mother behind. Even for the ones who did manage to get onto the evacuation ships, the images show how cramped they were. One memoirist, Chendinsky, had a younger brother who died on the ship shortly after it it had embarked. They had to throw his body into the Caspian Sea. And there are numerous mentions of such tragedies, and it does give you quite a lump in your throat to read such gut-wrenching accounts. So, what was their experience when the refugees arrived? It's important to clarify as well who was actually giving aid Um, As even though these Asian and African countries were the hosts, the responsibility for the shelters, the camps itself, food and aid, etc. differed from camp to camp. Now the MERRA, as I mentioned, was set up by the British, but it was actually a joint effort between many other organisations like the Red Cross and Save the Children and the Near East Foundation, which had been set up initially by US figures in response to the 1915 Armenian Massacre. Later, the United Nations joined in to help and essentially became the precedence for what was set up in 1950, the United Nations Refugee Agency. And running in tandem with these larger top-down agencies were grassroots or more localised organisations within the host Asian and African countries, which I'll discuss as we go through. Let's begin with India. And just as a quick disclaimer, I'm not going to be able to pronounce every word properly, so forgive me if I butcher the language, but I'll try my best. 
So, it's said that when one of the first evacuation ships docked in Mumbai, the British governor initially refused them entry. Upon hearing their plight, one of the local Indian princes from Navanagar, called Jam Sahib, ordered the ship to dock at Rosie Port in his province. From that point, what later became known as Little Poland in India began. The Balachati camp was set up near his summer palace. Another settlement in Valivadi, near the town of Kolhapur, was also established. About 5,000 refugees passed through this camp by 1948. And in these camps, schools, nurseries, a trading school and technical courses were established. The local community offered a great deal of assistance, not just in terms of food and hospitality, but when malaria broke out, the core of the medical staff were Hindu physicians. Within months, the Poles were able to play sports, have musicals and theatre productions, and the small camps flourished into established Polish settlements. Valivade is often referred to as a mini Poland, and in 2019, a memorial was built to commemorate the 5,000 Poles, a testament to their survival. One of the running themes in the memoirs is the return to psychological stability, the mentions of being able to wash again, have regular meals throughout the day, the humid climate and the return to safety. One of them talks about how they used toothpaste there for the first time and that it tasted so good they ended up eating most of it. There's also a pattern in the diaries about the quote exotic feel of India and how despite the complete contrast that India was for these Poles, um, that there's also an appreciation and respect there. So one of the memoirs describes Marathas as being an exceptionally beautiful place. Another one who settled in Karachi talks about it as if it was a garden of Eden and that the orchards of the unusual apples confirm this to us. And many of them recount learning about Indian culture, its complicated social structure, the many religions and the colourful saris. In contrast to India, the African camps were predominantly run by the British commanders. They made the decisions about the construction and the daily running of the camps, but that didn't mean that the Poles weren't able to experience life out outside of their refugee status. Similar to the Indian experience, the camps in Africa soon built educational and religious centres for the Poles to study in. Whilst in the Indian narratives that there was an emphasis on the exotic nature of the country, the memoirists reveal that in Kenya or Uganda, it was the first time they had actually seen black people. Bala Luwiki recounts how one night, after using the bathroom, he saw a black man running near him, and how in response he was frozen or engulfed in fear. It turns out the, the man wasn't running after him, of course. Another memoirist recalls seeing a group of natives armed with spears chanting, and how that their chanting had scared the Poles, but after the camp commander explained their traditional dress and that the chants were actually welcoming the Poles to Kenya, the diarist writes, we were never afraid again after that. And as the Poles settled, their interaction with the natives became quite harmonious, similar to the Indian narratives. There's a funny passage about how one of them had seen a lizard under the bed and had run out of the camp screaming that it was a crocodile. And this moment became a memorable family joke passed down onto their children later on. There's also another funny story about how one word in Polish meant something entirely different in Swahili, resulting in a moment of embarrassed laughter in the marketplace. So alongside the narrative of recovery and safety, humour and laughter is an ever resilient human trait. The natives would also volunteer to help the Poles build their homes or places of worship. One of them writes how, Never in my wildest imagination did I ever think that I would call such a country my temporary home. When we passed through the station, the Africans greeted us with, Hello white people, and we smiled and waved back, relieved to encounter such friendly people. The narratives produce similar patterns in the rest of the areas, so I'll read out one final quote from a Polish refugee school teacher arriving in the city of Isfahan in Iran. It reads, The friendly Persian people crowded around the buses, shouting what must have been words of welcome, and pushed gifts of dates, nuts, roasted peas with raisins and pomegranates through the open windows. Despite the overall recovery and these life-changing encounters and their return to a semblance of normality, the Poles were nevertheless still refugees, who were hearing stories from back home or receiving telegrams to notify them of deaths in their families and eagerly awaiting for that moment that would come on the 7th of May 1945 that Nazi Germany had been defeated.
Their accounts of joy are also mixed, though, with anger and betrayal, because earlier in February 1945, at the Yalta Conference, there was the announcement that the eastern sector of Poland would go to the Soviet Union. And so, despite the end of World War II, many Poles found themselves in a liminal stage, stuck between returning to a devastated homeland and that their adoptive countries were moving towards having their camps liquidated. As a result, many of the Polish refugees emigrated to Australia or the USA. The rupture of their identity from their homeland evidently didn't heal for all, and the thought of returning to a divided Poland, especially on the Soviet side, was unthinkable. These diaries and memoirs are a testament to human strength, resilience and decency from both the refugees and their host countries. In the larger or macro narratives of history, like World War II, to zoom into the smaller scale events or consequences gives us a witness to the better side of humanity. I've mentioned a few photos, so I'll put those on the Instagram page, Voicemails from History, and you can check them out there. This was your host, Mr. Amin. Thank you so much for listening to episode three of the Voicemails from History podcast.